definitely hear your point about the Fed being way behind the curve here, about the Fed overstimulating, about there being a massive disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street, that the markets don't necessarily reflect the real economy. That has been the case for a very long time now. And so it begs the question, why couldn't they just continue to kick this can down the road? Because the markets want that. The markets want a Fed pivot or a Fed pause. They want to continue playing this game, even if it is divorced from fundamentals, as you say it is. So why why would that cycle change? So Ask why yourself, different now? What this, here's what I compare this to, Michelle, and it's extremely simple. This is financial drugs. If, if, if I'm, I could be the most depressed in my whole life, my dog died, I lost my wife, and da 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 What, how, what, how, how, can I feel good in a moment? Heroin, cocaine, crack, alcohol. There's so many th- drugs you can take to make you feel good for some period of time, but when they wear off, then you get a hangover and you feel worse. This is the same exact thing. It's different when you're booming because a generation is growing up, getting more productive, earning more money, spending more money, bringing inflation down with their productivity because as people get older up to the point, they do get smarter and better and better workers. It's another thing when it's growing only because the government keeps printing more and more and more money. That is taking a financial drug, a toxic financial drug, which when it finally goes down and fails, you have a hangover. So we're going, we're going into a hangover. And then again, once it gets uh, to a certain point, it's hard to revive it. Because because people were skeptical at first when, when the, okay, every time we slow down, we just print money. Every time there's a stock market, print money. But the government did it long enough that people were like, well, it's working. Well, it's not working now. And it's backfiring on the central banks. And again, uh, there's no way that Jerome Powell after finally tightening way too late, after overstimulating, as we've been talking about, if he turned around and pivoted on this, it would look really ridiculous that he tightens a little bit and has to turn around and go back to easing. That would prove how weak the economy is, and it would make the Fed look reckless. They're what about the, a pause? What, what about a pause? Well, I that, mean, would what be, impact? that would be the smart thing to do. That'd be the smart, just say, okay, well, okay, we tighten, but it seems like the economy's reacting a little too much. That would be the smartest thing to do is pause. The markets would like that. I still think the economy is now at, at the point where where it's going to keep weakening now that it's that. See, so I, I even a again, Fed wait, pause? Let me, just let me just finish. It's not just, it's not tightening. This economy has been going only on escalating stimulus. You don't have to tighten to end this bubble. All you have to do is stop feeding the bubble. So even if they pause, we're not, we're not going to go back the normal, we're still the stock market is going to be on the weak side, but a pause would be the smartest policy right now, because uh, because coming back from tightening and going to easing would really look really bad for the Fed. All right. Well, I mean, the Fed's arguably had a pretty bad look uh, the last couple of years. Certainly that inflation transitory call, not really enforcing <laughs> any kind of sense of credibility there. Harry, I get your point about the U.S. economy being being overstimulated on drugs, on crack, requiring a major detox. And you've long said that recessions are not necessarily a bad thing because they're they're really they're the best thing. Recessions are more important than boom. I was a turnaround management early in my career. I went from being a company turning around Fortune 100 companies to doing the same thing with new ventures in California. It is only in crises that people really innovate. We always have Christ's light. Why, why, did, why did God create thunderstorms and lightning and all this stuff? If we're not stimulated by adversity now and then, we're getting a crisis, we don't wake up and really innovate and, and relook at things. We just we would rather just float down the river and, and hope that, that everything rains on our head and everything comes easy. So these crises are part. You can't have booms without bust. Right. We, cannot, we cannot be awake without sleeping to restore. So this is just the natural cycle. We have now taken an economy that has boomed so lot on it. It needs a rest. We need to flush out bad debts. You know how many zombie, the, the biggest growth industry is zombie companies. Companies that are barely alive only by not paying their debt service, but even without paying their bets, debt service, they can't, they, you know, they're just barely alive. So, so that's bad. Economy, free market capitalism works because you, you let people pursue success, but you also flush out the failures. 
failure. George Gilder is my favorite economist because <laughs> he says failure is the secret to capitalism. State-run companies never flush out their own state-owned industries and let them get fatter and fatter and less efficient until they fail. Free market capitalism relies on failure as well as success. So we're not, we're not allowing the failure. And we haven't since 2008. But you're saying that failure is inevitable now. The recession is coming. No. It's not a bad thing. It's going to clear. We have record debt and debt ratios. Right, right. Every time we have but record so, numbers. So what happens after the carnage? You've got to flush then. these debt and zombie companies out. Or you're got moving it. forward like an overweight person going slower and slower and slower, even if the fundamentals turn in your favor when the millennials will in a few years. Okay, so... I get that. It's not necessarily a bad thing. So give me the positive picture of what things look like after the carnage. What do things look like for the U.S. economy in 2025 then, give or take, seeing as you call the bottom in late 2024? Okay, so what happens, and this is already set in the cards. We just need to clear the decks to make them optimize. The millennial generation has their spending wave, like the baby boomers did from 83 to 2007, the Bob Hope generation before them, 42 to 1968. Well, this generation is shorter and smaller, relatively. Their boom is 2025 through 2037. So we will go in the U.S. into another boom. Now, of course, who's going to be booming more than us, who has many more people and many more younger people? It's all of Asia, okay? Not Japan, uh, not China. China already is peaking in their demographics currently right now. Uh, actually already and, and will continue. China's going to go, now listen to this, by 2100 from 4.2, I mean, I'm sorry, for, from uh, 1.4 billion people down to 770 million. Okay. They're going to lose hundreds of millions of people. Um, they're going to be the first emerging country to peak in demographic trends and go down, down, down. Developed countries all peaked decades ago, and one after another has been slowing down. But China's going to slow down more than any country in history. So, so again, this is another. So we come out of this. China's not going to lead coming out of this like they did. It's going to be Southeast Asia and all those countries. And India is the next, yeah. the next super large country that can urbanize. And, and, and grow at 1% a year, you know, urbanization and, and, and go up. So, so it's going to be a, 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 the U.S. will do best in that boom I'm talking about than Europe because we have stronger demographics, even though they're weakening. And India and Southeast Asia will do much better than China. China will never come out of this the same because here's the secret to China. They so overbuilt their economy. I, I know people have heard about it. 22%, now that was a couple of years ago, it's probably high. 22% of their homes and offices are empty. They just build stuff to stimulate the economy. They don't print money, they print condo. That's my word, you know, word for China. That's how they've been stimulated. So China comes back out. They're gonna never need to build a new house or office building ever again in a country that's already peaking its population and its whole spending wave and is going to do nothing but go down for decades. I mean, for as far as the eye can see, China is done. Not only are they done, they over leveraged with all these empty housing. They, they've so over leveraged that even the people, even the 20% that have yet to move into cities, they already have enough to accommodate and no need to build for it. So China will never see what it's seen again. And the, and the boom will continue to shift as it has for hundreds of years, east, east to west. So it'll go to Southeast Asia and India.